Now we finish looking at the museum, and to be honest with you, there's not a whole lot more to see on 6th Street, uh, except for maybe parking lot and some newer homes. When I say newer, of course, I mean newer than the ones I'm used to uh, putting on the videos. But at one time, uh, there's quite a bit of action going on the street. We think of the movers and shakers being on Military Street. That's where their homes were, a lot of them. But a lot of them were on 6th Street. It was only a block off military, close enough to go to work. And it was a very nice street. Quieter, didn't have the traffic. Had some trees along 6th Street and some very nice homes. And the reason that we know they're nice homes, well, we can see one in this picture, but not very good. But the real reason we know that there were nice homes is because the people that owned them had money. And one of those people who lived on 6th Street was J.B. Sperry. He had this uh, Sperry's Hardware store on the southeast corner of Huron and Grand River. Here's a rare photograph I came across that shows the inside of that store. And it looked like some pretty good bargains here. At least it would be today. Well, business was so good that Mr. Sperry's built a brand new store, Kitty Corner, from the present store that he was at. This would have been on the northwest corner of Huron and Grand River. And we come to know this as Sperry's department store. Another prominent businessman that lived on this street was Robert Miso. And uh, he was the vice president of Miso Dry Goods. He was also the vice president of Miso Manufacturing and vice president of Model Milling Company. If you recall, Miso department store started out as only three floors and then they added uh, more floors to it and it looked like this building right here. But most of us remember it as the People's Bank Building, which was on the northwest corner of Water Street and Military Street. Another prominent businessman that lived on 6th Street was Charles Boyce. Mr. Boyce was vice president and secretary of Boyce Hardware Company, which was located on Military Street. It was a premier hardware store because not only did they carry hardware, but they carried some pretty fancy things as you can see from this display window. Of course, many of us remember this building uh, is where military billiards was, and of course, uh, the Moose Club and, and uh, other businesses as well. The Runnels family had three prominent businessmen living on 6th Street. The first one was Horace Runnels, and he was the owner of Runnels Jewelry Store, which was located in the 100 block on the west side of Huron Avenue. Uh, right by the bridge. And as you uh, zoom into this picture, the unique thing about his store is out front, he had a large pocket watch hanging that actually told the time. So I thought that was pretty cool. You can't see it here, you might see it a little better in this picture here. It's on the upper right side of the picture above the first wagon. The second Reynolds that lived on 6th Street was uh, Charles Reynolds and he was the vice president of Aikman Bakery Company. The third Reynolds businessman that lived on 6th Street was uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Shubo Reynolds. And uh, he was the owner of S.D. Reynolds and Company, which was a real estate and insurance company. There were two shoe entrepreneurs on 6th Street, one from Foster Shoes and one from Farron Shoes. Fred Foster lived in the 1500 block of 6th Street, and uh, he was a co-owner along with his brother Will of Foster Shoes. This was on the northeast corner of Military Street and Water Street. It was pretty hard to miss Foster Shoes because of the signage on the building. Uh, not only in this picture, but also in this picture here. You can see from a distance that people could see it quite far away exactly where Foster Shoes was. The other shoe entrepreneur was B.C. Farron. He lived only one block away in the 1500 block uh, from Foster Shoes uh, owner. He went by B.C. Farron because his first name was Bethfield. And I don't think anyone would want to advertise that. He actually had two shoe stores, one on Military Street and one on Water Street. This picture appears to be right after the uh, store on Water Street was open. This was the inside of that store. Check this out. 
He also sold pianos and organs. You just wouldn't think those two things would go together, shoes and pianos and organs. But I imagine it would take a lot of shoes to make up the profit you'd make on one piano or organ. Uh, this photograph is the one on military that was located at the 900 block on the east side. I like this signage on the left that has his name, but on the right, rather than saying shoe bargains, it says foot bargains. I don't think we've ever seen that on a shoe store before and probably never will again. The building on Military Street is still there today. Today is occupied by the Gold Road Gallery. And uh, it's pretty much the same except it's missing the very top, the fancy part. Another well-known name was Ballantyne, Albert Ballantyne to be exact. He was the owner of the Ballantyne Dry Goods Store, or as we just knew it growing up, Ballantyne's, which was on the northeast corner of uh, Quay and Curran Avenue. Elmer Finesse was also a resident on 6th Street, and he was the owner of the Lee Manufacturing Company in South Park. I think it's amazing that uh, all these prominent businessmen lived on 6th Street in approximately a, a 10 block area. And that's not even all of them. There were attorneys, uh, there was a judge, there were doctors. Matter of fact, we'd like to look at one of those doctors right now. His name was Mortimer Wilson. The doctor's office was on the southwest corner of uh, 6th Street and Water Street. And we've looked at this building before. This is where the folks of my generation would remember Emerson Drugstore. But this isn't the building we want to look at. We want to go all the way to the other end of 6th Street in Griswold on the uh, southeast corner and look at this house. In her book, A Story of Port Huron, Helen Penlick tells the story of this house. She says this, Perhaps one of the oldest homes in Port Huron is now located at the southeast corner of Griswold and 6th Street. When you pass there, be sure to look at the interesting windows and fancy framework. It would now be 135 years old, and that was in 1975. Today, the house would be 177 years old. It certainly doesn't look like that old a home. This house was built by H.L. Stevens on the southeast corner of Military and Chestnut Streets about 1840. Many years later, it was moved to its present location, and the site was used for the lovely stone house still standing there, built by Dr. Mortimer Wilson. A number of years ago, Dr. Wilson's son had wanted to move this house stone by stone to a more desirable location but it was found to be so well built that it would have cost a fortune to have it dismantled and then rebuilt. And you can see from Google Maps that home is still there today. The last place we want to look at is just across the street on 6, uh, on the corner of 6 and Griswold, the southwest corner. Notice the higher elevation on this corner. This was known as Mitchell Hill which came from the home that was built by Judge William Mitchell in about 1856. Judge Mitchell owned all the property from Military Street to 7th Street and from Griswold to Oak. And uh, of course, uh, really the house wasn't built on 6th Street at that time because 6th Street didn't go all the way through. At one time, all along 6th Street, there was a sand ridge, which can be plainly seen if one looks closely. Starting at Pine Street, we find at Falk's funeral home that there were three steps from the curb to the sidewalk. At the Museum of Arts and History between Wall and Court Street, there's a long slope from the museum to the sidewalk. This is the block between Chestnut and White Street, and you can see from the sidewalk up going up to the home, uh, there's several steps, uh, actually many steps, it uh, looks like, uh, to get to the door. This house was originally painted white with green shutters, but 
Every time I went by this home, this is what it looked like. It was actually a dark brown, almost like it was stained. It didn't have any shutters, it didn't have a fence, but it was quite unique because it sat on top of a hill on Six and Griswold, which was kind of unique in itself. I'm not sure when this house was torn down, but another piece of our uh, history gone. All right, I think we're done with 6th Street. Let's go back to where we started at the intersection of 6th and Water Street. And before we get to 7th Street, uh, let's see what else there was on Water Street on the south side between 6th and 7th. Looking down from the satellite view, you can see there's not much there today at all, just parking lots and a bank. But at one time, uh, there was a lot of shops along uh, Water Street between 6th and 7th. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of photographs, but I do have a few here that I can share with you. I found this photograph on the internet, therefore that's why you have the, the watermarks on it, but it gives you a great picture of what that block looked like. This is looking east uh, down Water Street in the 600 block. One of the places I was very familiar with in this block was uh, a place called uh, Porter's Bakery. It was owned by Henry uh, Porter. It was there a long time. It goes all the way back to the 20s when it was Wimp Porter Bakery. But uh, it was very close to the Port Huron High School, uh, just across the bridge. And so my friend, Tom Dingwall, and I would go over there for lunch. And uh, we would brown bag it, go in there. He had a couple of tables set up. He didn't mind us coming in and eating our lunch there as long as we bought something. And I loved the raspberry tarts he had. They were delicious. Almost every day I would have one of those. And uh, I have fond memories of that place. And, and Henry back then was, uh, well, I thought he was pretty old back then, and he probably was. Him and his wife ran the bakery. Uh, and this picture that you're looking at, uh, I believe that's Henry out there. You can't see his face, but it looks like his profile uh, shoveling the walk off. If you look just east of the uh, bakery, you can see that barbershop pole, and that was Henry's Barbershop. Now, whether it's the same Henry or not, I don't know. I don't think you can be a baker and a barber at the same time. It's possible he could have owned it and hired barbers, or it's possible it's another Henry entirely. When we go a little further east, uh, we can see there's a sign. You can't see it very well because of the watermark, but there's a sign there that says Cafe. That was the uh, Venice uh, Cafe. Back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, it was the Brown American Restaurant. So it's been a restaurant or a cafe for quite a few years up to that point. A little further up the block, you'd find Sturmer's Hardware Store. I was under the mistaken impression that this was the first store that Sturmer's had before they moved to Military Street and this store here. But I was wrong. Uh, this is actually two different stores. They both operated simultaneously, and after the store on Military Street uh, went out of business, uh, they kept uh, they kept on on Water Street. So they were there a long time. The stores were owned by two different Sturmers. The one on Water Street was owned by W. L. Sturmer, or better known as Wally Sturmer, and the one on Military Street was owned by Charles and Carl Sturmer. I don't know if they were related or not. I, I would imagine perhaps they were. But it just goes to show you you can't always jump to conclusions. Well, we've pretty well covered the 600 block of Water Street, except for the store that was on the southeast corner of 7th and Water. So we'll take a look at that in our next video, and then we'll mosey down 7th Street and see what there is to see there.